Hello and welcome to this Economist event. Uh, my name is Guy Scriven. I'm the climate risk correspondent at The Economist. Uh, and today's event is part of The Economist Sustainability Week, uh, which we are doing in the in a run up to COP26 in Glasgow. Uh, today, we're going to discuss climate resilience and the questions facing companies. And I'm delighted to be joined here by Harry Balcott from a uh, senior partner at McKinsey. Harry, thank you so much for coming. Hi, Guy. Um, Harry, I want to jump straight in uh, with a question about climate resilience. And so hmm. you hear some people kind of argue that, 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 that we're kind of past the stage at which we need to think about resilience. I mean, is it, 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 it do you buy that argument? Is it too late to kind of start thinking about climate resilience? And start I don't buy it? the argument. No, I don't, I don't buy it. Uh, and, and that's mostly because um, resilience against climate hazard isn't a binary thing. Um, for some, you know, around 3 billion people in the world today, there is some form of exposure to climate hazard already. Uh, and what's going to happen as a, as a consequence of the emissions trajectory that, are, that we're on is that that vulnerability is going to get both much broader up to around you know, half the world's population by 2030 and also much more severe. So there's going to be a tripling of the number of people who are exposed to severe climate hazard. Um, and it's not evenly distributed either. So India, for example, will represent about 25% of all of the people in the world who are exposed to severe climate hazard. So this is a fast changing situation and, and it's a chronic situation. So perhaps there's an analogy here to do with, you know, dieting and, and exercise, you know, it's, it's, it's never too late to start doing those things, you know, no matter how unhealthy you are when you start. So, so I think efforts to build resilience um, are going to make things better whenever we start. Now, um, in that sense, of course, it's not too late. Um, but there is a hurry up as well, of course, because you know, the best way to reduce humanity's exposure to climate hazard is to uh, limit climate hazard by suppressing our emissions. And of course, you know, you look at what the IPCC said in August or what the UNNDC said on Friday, um, we're not currently doing enough. Now, um, every fraction matters. Um, the difference between a one and a half degree world and a two degree world is about a billion people um, exposed to climate hazards. So uh, we definitely need to get cracking um, in reducing our emissions just to reduce the overall number of people who are exposed. So um, I don't buy the argument that it's too late uh, overall, but I, I do recognize the urgency in getting stuck in. That's great. And so you've, I mean, you've described there a kind of future where there's, there's more severe um, kind of climate hazards and they affect kind of many more people. But can you, can you talk about how that affects kind of capital markets and, and companies. I mean, it's not necessarily clear what, you know, yeah. a big American manufacturer kind of should do or has to do about, about that. So could you just talk, talk about the kind of commercial side of this? Yeah, thing? of course. Of course. Well, at its, you know, at its simplest um, for a company, just starting with companies for a minute, um, resilience is about being able to maintain business operations despite the, the long term chronic pressures of heat stress, water shortage, riverine and coastal flooding, as well as the more acute short term things like wildfires and hurricanes, just to use two examples that have been in the press over over this summer. So it's about maintaining that business continuity in the face of those two different types of threat. Now, a more nuanced approach to that for a company would say that this can also be a source of competitive advantage, because if you can be um, less exposed than your competition, or if you are uh, less vulnerable to the hazard that you are exposed to, uh, then you should be able to maintain productivity, reduce unit costs, um, perhaps provide more reliable customer service. If you're a logistics company, for example, moving through areas that are exposed to climate hazard, you can be more precise about when your uh, packages will arrive. Um, so, so at its simplest, it's about business continuity. But then I think for a company, it can be about competitive advantage. And that, of course, I think also means that it can be a, an opportunity. And I think we do need to talk about opportunity uh, in the whole climate debate, because 
um, to build resilience is going to require the spending of an awful lot of money. Um, and that can feel onerous or it can feel like an obligation. Um, but actually, where, where money is reallocated from one place to another, when capital flows, you know, that is always an opportunity for companies to think about how they can shift their portfolios, their product propositions into those faster growing areas. So clearly to build resilience, there's going to have to be spending on utilities, infrastructure, air conditioning, all sorts of categories. So I think there's a, a classic corporate strategy question for companies too. Um, and of course, if you've got business continuity, competitive advantage and portfolio reallocation going on, you know, then this will quite quickly become interesting to the capital markets because, well, as you will know, Guy, yeah. you know, they are becoming increasingly sophisticated as they think about how to price in, you know, physical risk. Yeah. Um, and today that's focused on carbon intensity in a portfolio. Um, mm -hmm. But tomorrow that's going to include an understanding of the fragility of the assets of a company that they are invested in or, or lending to. Um, so I do think that over time we will start to see lower costs of capital being associated with more resilient organizations in the same way that we're starting to see that you know, for less carbon intense um, organizations. I was I was gonna I was gonna ask before because I had a few questions about capital markets, but I was gonna ask mm. before we get onto that about supply mm. chains. Um, because you know, this is obviously another area where lots of people are discussing the kind of relative uh, advantages of kind of resilience versus kind of speed and efficiency of supply oh. chains. And I just wondered, and you know, this is this has particularly come to the to the fore with the kind of COVID pandemic and the kind of yeah. fraying Sino-American relations. And so I just wondered, you know, how uh, kind of climate resilience fits into that fits into that pattern on supply chains. Gosh, that is a that is a very big question, and it will be different for different types of um, good that are being moved around. Um, mm. I, I certainly agree with you that the pandemic has shown uh, the fragility, perhaps, of a just-in-time mindset applied evenly. But climate resilience will affect all sorts of different things. So climate climate resilience will shift um, agrarian production around the world. Mm. So many of the main trunks that we currently use to move grain, for example, around will, will change slowly but and imperceptibly, perhaps. But there will be moments when mm -hmm. um, port infrastructure, for example, shifts um, because agrarian productivity is shifting. So the actual routes themselves will shift. The second thing I think we will see, and this will be different for different categories, is that inventory will be held in different places to insulate against the risk of climate hazard happening in different places. So we may well see nearshoring of some bits of inventory and late stage assembly, for example. We may see um, you know, warehouses and hub and spoke models being created in, in different ways. And I think um, as resilience builds and our ability to track in real time the performance of a supply chain uh, builds as well, I don't expect us to see any decay in precision or predictability around the supply chains, because I think our ability to be tra transparent will build in lockstep. So I think there are going to be a number of different forces at play, but, but really this will come down to you know, each supplier and each value chain working out its individual exposure along the chain for the particular goods that it's moving and trying to work out where to hold those inventories. That's really interesting. And just back onto capital markets. Sorry, we're mm -hmm. bouncing around here. But I mean, one of the I guess one of the things that investors find kind of useful in the um, discussions around the kind of environmental impact and environmental risk that a company has is is to have kind of measures kind of quite solid yeah. and, and what are now quite kind of universal measures like carbon intensity and things yeah. like that. And in the case of resilience, it, I'm not necessarily aware of any kind of current good ways to kind of capture that in a, in, a, in a unit of measurement. And I just wondered what you kind of thought about whether you'd seen any interesting kind of ways to try to measure it and what you thought the development of that kind of data would, would look like yeah. over, over the next few years. Yeah, I'm not aware of it either. 
um, mm -hmm. and this is a um, this is quite an important challenge because you know the race to zero you know does have a clearly defined metric and an end target associated with it you know resilience doesn't um, because you've got so many competing factors and because resilience itself is in large part um, based on the vulnerability of the person or the supply chain to start with um, you know it is one of the sad facts of our climate hazard that it's regressive right you know the uh, mm. The, the third most vulnerable people in the world are twice as likely to be exposed to climate hazard as the rest. So this is one of the things that I know, you know, uh, Nigel Topping and Gonzalo Munoz in the race to resilience have been grappling with. What are the a balanced set of metrics that can be used to chart our relative progress on resilience? And, and, and where I get to at the moment is to start with, we have to think about relative improvement. Um, because it's very difficult to try and create a, uh, a single metric with a single start point that we can all use to create a journey. So we yeah. can't wait for that perfect maths to be done. Let's get cracking yeah. by talking about um, relative improvement. Okay. And just uh, just on the on the topic, I guess, of, of, of getting cracking, right? We're not we're not far out from COP26 at the moment. Yep. Um, and, you know, hopefully kind of resilience is going to be a, a, a big topic there. I mean, could you could you give me a sense of what you on on the kind of resilience uh, theme, what you would expect as a kind of outcome from the COP to be? Yep. And, and, and then what what would kind of make you happy as in like what would kind of beat your expectations? What would be a very good, good COP in terms of outcomes for resilience? <laughs> Yeah, I think um, I think three things, Guy. I think the first thing is, um, you know, this COP needs to build awareness of resilience and put it on the same footing as uh, as mitigation. Um, you know, increasing climate hazard is now inevitable, um, and so we do need to um, you know get cracking on that and mobilise in the same way that the race to zero was mobilised over the last eighteen months. The second thing that I think would be a terrific outcome is. Um, you know, we do need to see uh, accelerated commitments on decarbonisation. As I said a few minutes ago, um, reducing emissions is the best way to avoid accelerated climate hazard and therefore you know, keep those billion people I mentioned earlier uh, insulated. And then the third thing I think is that it would be terrific if COP could put in place some of the financial plumbing, as Mark Carney calls it, but some of the mechanisms that will allow capital to flow around the world, whether that's from the private sector or between nations to to fund the resilience that people around the world need. So those would be the three things that will come immediately to mind. That's really interesting. And just just because I think we've been talking, you know, uh, slightly abstractly about <clears throat> about kind of resilience um, in a, in a sense because you know it's, it's almost inevitable that that you do. But I wondered just before just before we wrap up, I wondered whether you could just give me a sense of. We, you know, are there particular countries that you think are kind of very good or good at kind of resilience and, and kind of what, what measures have they kind of put in place to, to kind of bolster the, the, their, their climate resilience of, of, of their kind of their shores or not necessarily <laughs> physical um, shores, but, you know, their country? Well, but it, but it is physical shores in, in, in many mm. places. So um, I think the answer probably, Guy, is I'm very happy to be corrected on this, by the way, by, by representatives of countries watching this. But I, but I think the, um, the answer is that there are a number of countries that have had to deal with particular dimensions of climate hazard that have been, if you like, endemic for them for a long time. You know, mm. think about the Netherlands and sea level. Think about the small island developing states and sea level. Think about um, the Middle East and uh, northern India and heat, for example, mm -hmm. where there are um, at least practices in place that, that, that help. But the truth is, I don't think there is really an example anywhere um, of a nation that is ready for the uh, acceleration and severity of climate hazard um, mm -hmm. that is uh, likely now, given the emissions trajectory that we're on. So we're all going to have to learn, I think, um, new things. Um, but I'm, I'm sure there will be elements of that uh, solution that we can piece together from things that have been done around the world before. And on that, on that, I thought it was going to be a somber note to end, Harry, but that actually turned into a very optimistic. Uh, <laughs> <note>. <laughs> so, um, 
uh, that that leaves me kind of just with enough time to say thank you, Harry, so much for for becoming and talking us through, you know, how you're seeing this really important topic, and to thank our audience as well. Um, please stay tuned uh, for the next session, uh, which will start shortly. Thank you so much. Thank you.